Hello and welcome back. I'm Shana Searcy. I'm so excited to paint with you today. Thanks for joining me once again. And we are here for a tiny Tuesday, a new theme that I am going to be releasing a video every Tuesday where I work on small paintings, where we're focusing on experimentation and play um, as we plan and develop our skills and or compositions for other paintings. So today I have taken my 8x8 B watercolor paper sketchbook. I've divided it into four equal sections here. You don't have to divide it the same way. I just encourage you to break down whatever page you have into smaller sections. Um, so this started out as an 8x8. So these are like 3x3-ish. Three three um, or actually, yeah, 3x3 three because three you have the tape in, in between. Maybe 3.5x3.5. Three and a half by three and a half. So the first square I'm going to focus on, all of these today are going to be landscaped themed. The only one I'm going to draw in is this first one. I'm going to put some buildings in and then the rest are going to be even kind of looser and more playful where I'm not going to plan anything out. I did want to just put in um, some buildings so I could play with light and shadow um, on structures in this one. So you'll see that later on in the video. What I think is really important for beginner watercolor artists to remember is that you don't have to tackle each piece of paper and each painting as if it was going to be the final or completed piece. Almost no watercolor artist, uh, professional, amateur, or otherwise really does that um, when they are creating larger pieces. So it's okay to experiment and play at the smaller level, even as you progress in skill. This is not just a place to learn skills um, and to practice skills, but also a place to try out ideas. And ideas will forever be something that you will be cultivating. Um, so you'll have an idea, you may have acquired all the skills you need to execute it, but you wanna see if that idea is the right fit and try a, diff a few different things out. So painting on a smaller scale is something you can do for the rest of your life as an artist, um, creating on a smaller scale. Uh, you're really prototyping, you're planning, you're sketching, um, and preparing for the next time you're going to do a much larger piece. So here in this one, you can see I put in my two buildings and then I am just putting in sections um, that I'm going to create as like rolling hills and I'm playing with different colors that I might see in grasses and uh, I use my raw sienna. I'm using hookers green and I'm using some sap green in there. And I'm playing with these browns and greens together to give the illusion of um, kind of, you know, weedy, dirty, dusty, um, rolling hills that might be a little rocky, um, might not be perfectly lush and green everywhere. I'm going to put in a sky. I'm going to use phthalo blue for my sky. There's lots of different color blues you can use for your sky, depending on what kind of mood and what kind of feeling you want to communicate with your viewer. I chose phthalo for this one in this color combination. We'll see at the end if that's what I will go with if I ever wanted to turn this piece into a larger piece. Um, I might decide, nope, that wasn't quite the right blue, but overall the whole concept was great. I'm gonna recreate this, but I'm gonna tweak some of my color choices. Again, a great way to use this small painting um, practice. So one of the things that I wanted to practice in this one and why I put in the buildings was just playing with light and practicing with light and shadow on structures or buildings. So the first thing you have to do when you're playing with light on structures and buildings is decide where are your light sources or where is your main light source coming from, even if it's very subtle. It doesn't have to be dramatic. So this one, I've decided the light is coming from the left. So everything on the left or facing the left direction will be slightly lighter than everything facing the right side of the page. So here the two roofs are both facing opposite ways. So this one in front is facing towards the left. So it will be the lighter of the two. And then the one in the back is facing towards the right. So it will be the darker of the two. Now where this is really going to start to pop and feel like 
we've created um, a sense of light in this picture is when we add um, the shadows for the buildings. So these buildings are white. They're going to translate as white and we're going to leave one side white, but they're going to have a darker side and that darker side can't be a darker white, um, but it has to be a gray. So that light gray along with the white of the opposite side is going to translate as white, but the dark gray is going to look like it's in shadow. So putting on the shadow on the right hand side of these, and then I'll add some other details to the building, some doors and windows. I will have to let that gray dry completely, but just putting on a little bit of a roof angle. So on the side in that darker color, so you can see just adding that tiny little detail there gives it contrast, which makes the painting feel so much more um, dynamic or exciting. That tiny little detail made everything pop twice as much by just putting that darker shade of brown on the right hand side of that lower building. So I'm just adding in um, doors and windows, keeping them very simple, just squares and rectangles. I'm gonna give everything a little bit of a dry just so I can get into painting in some more of the details. I am gonna put darker doors or windows on the right sides of the buildings, but I have to just make sure everything is dry first. Otherwise you will have very blobby looking rectangular doors and windows. They won't be very rectangular um, if you put them on while it's still wet. So these you want to make even darker than what's on the left hand side because these are in shadow as well. So even your gray, it might not be completely black, that's okay, but it should be darker than what's on the other side. All right, so I'm also going to look at adding some additional texture. Um, but before I do that, let's get into putting in the ocean. Now I picked up phthalo blue again at first, and I think my phthalo had a little black in it or a little gray in it um, accidentally, but I'm just blending it out here. I put it darkest at the top towards the horizon line and trying to blend it down. I didn't get to it too quickly, so I have a little bit of a hard line there, but I think I'm gonna pick up some ultramarine and see what that looks like. I'm gonna add ultramarine right on top and see what we have in terms of color. Hmm. Now, I don't love the ultramarine color um, in this, but it does separate or differentiate the sky from the ocean. Um, I definitely could have done that just by changing the value of the phthalo blue. So having the phthalo blue darkest at the horizon. Well, let's zoom in here and get nice and close um, and take a look. So don't love the ultramarine. I'll let it dry completely and see what I think. But if I were to do this on a bigger scale, I don't think that's the color I would choose for the ocean. I'm just adding in, I'm gonna play my way through some texture on the grass area. I'm using all sides of my brush, the tip of my brush, the side of my brush. I am letting my brush run out completely of water and pigment and using some br dry brushing to create some texture. Um, this is a great way to, or a great idea, is to experiment with texture and how your brush moves and works um, on different surfaces and how to get those dry brush textures versus smooth, um, gradients that you're trying to create. So more practice with that and more experimentation with that, the better for all of you, especially as beginners. So now let's move into our second square. So I'm going to pick up ultramarine. So all of these again are going to be landscapes. So in square number two, I'm going to start with a sky and a ground base. So I'm going to do a blue sky, a green ground. The blue sky chose ultramarine just to get started and adding a little bit more saturation and kind of feeling my way through how bright and blue do I want this? Do I want it very subtle? Do I want certain spots that are white? I'm trying to lift out a little color, um, get down to a horizon line and kind of see where we are. And then I'm going to pick up hooker's green and add that in for the grass. Now hooker's green and this ultramarine blue, I do not love together. This is very much a typical, you know, 
blue sky green grass set up but the green was just a little too cool for me so I'm adding some additional layers of green with my sap green and you can see I'm kind of putting it in the foreground I'm putting it wet on wet I'm layering over top of what was already there it's bleeding out too much on me right now too far too fast so I'm going to give it a quick dry and that way I can work with the surface a little bit better once it's mostly dry. So these other squares, the first one I spent a lot of time on, almost 10 minutes. Um, this one and the subsequent ones after this, I'm going to try to spend less and less time as I go. So adding in some raw sienna there. And mixing up a little bit more sap green. I'm not really sure where I'm going with this one. I think I'm going to put in like a tree over in this corner on the side and just practice some textures and strokes with my brush to create the illusion of a pine tree. And now extending some of that out into the ground or in the grass. This doesn't look like a very exciting pine tree to me. <laughs> and playing with our foreground, um, creating a little hill or knoll there, seeing what I get as I kind of envision <laughs> what this little square is gonna hold for me. Mixing up a little gray. I'm gonna put in a little gray kind of structure, rock, mountain in the background. I'm not really sure, honestly. I'm just deciding there needs to be something here in the background further away than our tree in the front. Um, so I'll make something in the shape of a mountain or maybe it's a mountain with a building on it. I'm not really sure. Or maybe it's a mountain with a tree on top, but that doesn't look right either. So again, it's okay to experiment. It's okay to not know exactly where you're going. And it's okay to end up somewhere you didn't think you were going and being really happy where you ended up. Um, that is fine too. So now I've created like this mountain is structure in the background that's far away that you can't really see. It's getting lighter and lighter. I kind of like it. Uh, we have this kind of layered feel now, a uh, field in the middle with this rocky cropping structure in the back. I'm going to add some more gray to it to give it more of a mountainous um, kind of feel to it versus the green that was giving off tree vibes leaving a little green in there and then I have this other foreground of green that I'm turning into grasses and a little knoll as well as the tree over to the right so by figuring it out and finding my way through there I feel like I've actually come up with a decent composition that I would explore further at a larger level um but overall, as a, a painting or a piece, you know, just adding in some more texture right now, um, some more definition to the tree, a little bit more contrast. This contrast is pretty flat uh, in terms of what we have here. It's a bright, sunny day. That's fine. Um, but... Depth. So I'm going to move on to my third one. I paused the recording in between, so sorry about that um, and forgot to turn it back on. But I'm using dioxazine purple here. I'm going way off the rails and I'm putting in a perfect a purple sky, which is great. It's great to experiment with unlikely colors as well and see what you get, see what you enjoy. It doesn't always have to be super realistic. So purple sky doesn't mean there can't be a purple sky either. Crazier things have happened, um, especially at those transition times like sunrise and sunset. So I'm going to put in a purple sky. I'm putting in some additional stripes wet on wet just to give the sky a little texture. But I think I'm going to play with it a little bit more after it dries as well. So let's move on to the base. I'm going to give this another green base, but I'm making this a very dark um, phthalo blue and sap green mixed together. So I've cooled down my phthalo, or I'm sorry, I've cooled down my sap green with the phthalo blue. Um, and I'm just going to blend this out up to the sky. And you can see I started really dark in the foreground. 
And now I'm blending to a lighter color in the background and also playing with lifting out some color as well. And I think what I'm gonna do here is create a little like poppy field or um, a flower field. I'm gonna play with vertical texture. So just taking the tip of my brush and flicking it upward, creating vertical texture here. So this is a big field of tall stemmed plants. Right now it just looks like grass, but I am gonna add in. So the important thing is to remember, this is all still wet. So this is all wet on wet. So anything I put in is gonna bleed out a little bit and be hazy and fuzzy. So the stems, the vertical stems, and also these red mm -hmm. poppy colored flowers. Now it's important to remember, I'm putting these red flowers on top of, and yellow ones apparently, on top of green and purple background. And because it's watercolor, it's transparent. So the purple and green black background are going to affect the color of these flowers. So as they bleed out, they're mixing and mingling with that purple and green. Um, so you can see their color becomes a little duller, a little more muted. You just have to keep that in mind. All right, I'm gonna move on from this piece. It's not the most amazing piece, um, but I played with the color in the sky, the texture down below. I'm lifting color out. The paints I'm using, core watercolor paints, aren't the greatest for lifting. They are highly staining, so just keeping that in mind, depending on your brand. Some brands uh, stain more than others, and some colors stain more than others. So moving on to my fourth and final square, I am using cobalt teal for the sky. Now, I have recently discovered this color for skies and I absolutely adore it. Um, and you'll see, I think in the next Tiny Tuesday where we really explore this cobalt teal color. So I'm throwing in some of that mix of sap green and thalo blue, so that really cool um, color temperature um, green. And I'm just throwing in the ground and some bushes and I'm doing it wet on wet. And you can see it kind of creates these crazy little um, bleeds there that actually look like bush spikes. So I just put in some bushes. Um, they're a little too dramatic for me. So I am gonna use my brush to soften them a little bit in a few areas. But that wet on wet looks great and it creates such a nice texture for us. All right, now I'm adding just a little bit more color underneath the bushes, give it a little shade or shadow under there. And I love this cobalt teal and green sky. This to me looks so much better for a bright sunny day than the ultramarine. I'm gonna add in some yellow on top here. This is actually seeming to brighten up that space under the bushes just a little adding in some other textures in some darker greens, some vertical textures with my the tip of my brush, and just trying to make it kind of a messy bramble of bushes and grasses and weeds kind of all growing in the edge of some you know farm property um, with that beautiful blue sky um, behind it. It makes me wanna go pick blueberries, I feel like. Now, that may mean nothing to you, but if you're in the Northeast, it probably will mean something or on the, the East Coast. Um, that looks like blueberry picking season to me. Let's dry everything off and take a look. Now, I think I'm going to add a little bit more to our third one with the purple sky. I feel like it could use another layer. I did everything wet on wet. Cadmium red and cadmium yellow are highly um, opaque for watercolors. So if you're putting them onto something light, so you can see this cadmium red I'm putting onto a relatively light surface, it is gonna cover it up pretty well. So I put it down on top, kind of creating a second layer of these flowers that are a little closer to us. And I'm also gonna put on another layer of the stems in front of what's already there. So increasing the contrast by um, adding a darker value for both the red and the green kind of gives this some more depth and dimension. It was laying pretty flat for me before. Everything was like exactly the same 
value. If you turn that painting into a black and white image, it would literally look flat black and white like there was nothing in the picture. Everything was the same value. So just going back and adding a little additional contrast can really help pop things up. And then the sky too, the sky is a little flat. I'm going to add ultramarine, like a wash of ultramarine right on top of this. So this is what we would call actually a glaze when you put color over top of another color in a thin layer. So I know that they're going to interact with each other and I actually want that but I want to influence the first layer that's down there. So I'm adding a thin layer of this ultramarine blue on top and I'm blending them together. Um, I love the dimension this is giving to the sky, making it just a little bit richer, not as flat um, and gray looking, but added another little pop of color. So again, we're going to dry this all off and then we're going to dry it all off and take off our tape. Taking off the tape is the best part. With B watercolor paper, you do want to be really careful. And I use straight up masking tape on this, like not even painter's tape. So what I'm going to do is use my heat tool to heat up the adhesive. And you can do this with any paper that's sensitive to tape um, and any kind of tape you have. Maybe not duct tape. That's a little bit strong for anything. But pretty much all the other masking tapes and painter's tapes, if you heat them up first, they'll peel off like a dream. No harm, no foul, no fuss. Um, so definitely keep that trick in your back pocket when you have paper that is sensitive to peeling when you peel off your tape or ripping. Um, so after I get this dried, we'll take a look at our four pieces. Thank you so much for joining me for this tiny Tuesday painting day. And we will have another one next week as well. And we're going to keep going until you guys get sick of these. And we'll just bop around to different themes and different things you can paint at a tiny scale. As always, I'm Shana Searcy, and I'm so happy to paint with you each and every day. Thank you for continuing to join me. Don't forget to check the description of this video for more information on the supplies that we used. And also, don't forget to like and subscribe, leave a comment, check out the Studio Crew membership, and find me on social media. All right, everyone, take care and happy painting.